And I'm thankful for being a part of the great family of God. Thankful for my brothers and sisters. Faithful people that love the Lord and want to serve Him. And uh, that's why you're here today. You're here because you love Him. We come because we love Him. In fact, we call this a service. And the reason we call it a service is because that's exactly what it is. We do service to Him. It's not a service for us. It's a service for Jesus. Amen. And uh, it is a, a glory. And, a, and we're very thankful that we can do service to the King of Kings. Praise God. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me today? Brother Gordon, can I ask you, please, if you will, to pray and ask the Lord's blessing. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank Lord, you. we thank you thank that we can Jesus. be here thank thank this morning. We thank you that we can gather together uh, in, 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 in your name, Lord. That we can gather together in one mind and one accord, yes, Lord Jesus. We are so blessed. Lord, we just pray that you have your way in the message this morning, dear God, that it may touch us, Lord, that we may be open, that we may mm. open our hearts to your word this have morning, dear God, that you may convict our hearts, that you may touch our hearts, dear Lord God. Lord, wherever we need to be touched, wherever we need to be corrected, Lord, correct us. Wherever we need to be educated, educate us, Lord, yes, Lord. wherever we need to be Corrected, correct us this morning. Hallelujah. Dear God. Hallelujah. Let us be malleable in your hands yes, while we Lord. pray. And we pray in your glorious Almighty name in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Amen. Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, my brother. Praise the Lord. We appreciate you and thank you for being present today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Savior. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Have your way, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. I am sent today to remind us and to remind us of a very important principle in our Christian war. If I was to ask you, what is your ambition as a Christian? Uh, I'm sure I'd get some different answers. In fact, let me ask that question. Let's see some hands. Uh, what's your ambition as a Christian, Brother Mike? Make it to heaven. I want to get to heaven. That's very good. What's your ambition out there? Come on. Anybody? Yes, please, Jane. Hello, Jesus. Follow Jesus. All right. Praise God. I'm sure, Sister Jane, to be right with God and to minister to others. Yes. Bring others with me. Bring, bring others to heaven with me because that's that's where I'm going. What would you say, John? Want to go home? Yes. I think we all feel a bit that way. Praise the Lord. And so you see, there is such a thing as a Christian ambition, a desire, something that we wish to achieve. I want you to turn with me to James, the first uh, chapter, and read with me the very first verse. Thank you, Jesus. James chapter 1 and verse 1 says this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. And uh, you see, he, he greets us, uh, but he presents himself as James, a servant of God. I want you to also, while you're there, turn to John chapter 13 and verse 14. Read there with me. John chapter 13 and verse 14. Let me read three verses this morning. Three portions. John 13, 14 says this, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. You might recall that this was at the time when, uh, directly after the supper, the Lord put a towel, literally, he gird himself as a servant, and he began to wash his disciples' feet. Something that is unthinkable because... He is the master. He is the one that is in charge. He is, he is the one that they were following. And yet he showed them the example. And in doing that, he showed us the example of servitude. And the last portion of scripture I'd like you to read with me is in Philippians chapter 2. And let's read verses 5 to 8. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. It reads this way. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but notice, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus, the Lord of glory, the almighty God, took on a body of flesh, became man, but not just any man. He didn't just simply come and, and reign as a king over some uh, great reign. He came as a servant. He came to show us how to live 
a Christian life. Now, the very title Christian literally means to be followers of Christ or to be Christ-like, imitators of Christ. And I, I'm going to submit to you that our greatest achievement as Christians, our greatest ambitions as Christians ought to be to be like Jesus. Amen. Amen? Yeah. Otherwise, our name doesn't mean what it means, what it says. Otherwise, we're literally applying to ourselves a name or a title that really doesn't belong to us. When you say, I am a Christian, you're literally saying, I am Christ-like. And that ought to be our ambition. That ought to be our desire. That ought to be our striving that we become more like Him. Let me just use the epistle of James as the basis for what we are saying here today. You see, James, the epistle of James was written by that James that was also known as James the Just or James the brother of Jesus. He was literally related to the Lord Jesus. They had the same mom. And uh, ahead of uh, all of the Gospels and most of the books that were written by Paul, this epistle of James holds actually prominence as being one of the earliest and one of the oldest uh, actual written documents that the early church had. So it was one of the earliest written Christian records, if you please. Not only this, but uh, James, of course, was directly related to the Lord. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, calls James also an Apostle. And the, the reason for that, and this is why it is an appropriate title for James, because he actually saw the risen Christ. The Bible records that Jesus appeared to James, that's his brother, and to the twelve. Now, it's interesting because during the lifetime of Jesus here on earth, James, his brother, the very writer of this epistle, had not actually become one of his apostles. But after his resurrection, seeing the risen Christ, James not only became totally converted, he became totally convinced and a great tool in the hand of God. And so, yes, an apostle indeed. But more than that, we read, if you care, that he was very much distinguished amongst the first people there in Jerusalem. In fact, amongst the early leaders and believers of the apostolic year. And he was, in fact, the very first bishop of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, if you read also in Acts chapter 15, and I'm sure that you've studied it with us at the first council of Jerusalem, dealing with matters of great importance to the early church, it was actually uh, James that summarized the final decision of the council and gave God's direction and God's wisdom to Paul and to Barnabas to go and deliver the message that they had determined to the Gentile churches and to the Gentile believers. And so you have quite a, an amazing or quite an extraordinary CV with James. James could uh, present himself to any employer and say, no, this, is, this is my CV. It reads pretty good. Okay, my curriculum vitae. This is what I've done. This is who I am. This is where it's at. But yet I want you to notice how in opening his own uh, epistle, how he presents himself. He simply calls himself a servant. He doesn't say, James, the brother of Jesus. He doesn't, in other words, call on his background as association by family. He doesn't present himself, James, as the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, although he was. And he could have. He doesn't even present himself as the bishop of Jerusalem or, or the elder. He simply says, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And I think there's great significance in that. And I'd like to point out that he wasn't the only one who referred uh, to himself that way. Paul himself, in a number of uh, portions of his writings, refers to himself as a servant first, even though he mentions being an apostle. And also Peter in 2 Peter 1 and 1 says he calls himself a servant. My question today is, what made these great men of God, and many others like them, by the way, both in the Old and the New Testament. I mean, think of Moses, and he was titled the servant of God, of the living God. Think of Abraham, a servant of God. Think of any of the great men that walked with God. They were all adorned by this title that to us today may seem somehow of a, well, actually, not much at all. A servant? A servant. A servant. What made these men put aside their credits and put aside all of their achievements and present themselves by such a modest description as to identify themselves first and foremost as a servant of God? A servant of God. 
I guess you could say that if they lived in our day and age, perhaps to appear more credible in the eyes of the world, uh, they might have used their more impressive credentials, or maybe they should have. Should they have done that? I mean, we all agree, don't we, that when we are looking for information and uh, opinions, or if we're studying something, we try to look up who is this person, and we look at their credentials. Do they have uh, some authority in this field? Do they, uh, do they know what they're talking about? And we give credit to the fact that they have some credentials. We all agree we like to do that because we like to trust what he says, what this person says. And so even in confiding or leaving people to do work for us, whether it's our car, for instance, uh, do you, would you go to a qualified mechanic for your vehicle or would you go to the local janitor, for instance? You know, you tend to go to people that you see as qualified. And at face value, when you hear a man of God say a servant, he doesn't appear qualified. In fact, I dare say that by today's standards of our world and by today's uh, degrees and everything else, most of the apostles wouldn't have the qualifications. But I'm going to tell you something. They were more than qualified because they were servants of the living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I want us to be reminded today that it doesn't matter what other qualification you may have. It matters not if in your work, in your professional life, you are a registered doctor or a street cleaner. It matters not to God if you're a servant of the living God. You represent Jesus the Lord. Amen. And I want to remind us today that this is what we need to aspire to is to be servants of the living God. Why is servant the best qualification that the people of God offer up? Why is that the case? Why is it that they don't draw from their CVs and say, look, look at this piece of information. Look at my credits here. Why is servant the very best thing that we could possibly come up with? And I, I guess if I, my own epitaph ever, there is one, uh, it says simply, Max, the servant of God, I'll be happy. I'll be happy because that's exactly what I would strive to be. What I would want to be recognized as a servant of the living God. Hallelujah. I would strive this morning to say, and it's my duty and privilege, I guess, to remind us all that we must see ourselves with respect to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, that as true Christians, being a servant is the right fit. It's the right description. And secondarily, that it is the safest position to be in. And thirdly, and this is what God showed me, is that it would be our greatest achievement. That one day Jesus can say to you and I, well done. Notice, my good and faithful servant, enter into my rest. It seems to me that God recognizes servants. He sees your heart. He sees what you do. And if you're a servant at heart, uh, then he certainly uh, wants that from you and I, and he rewards accordingly. So first of all, servant is the right fit for the Christian. It's the right fit. We don't need to go by any other titles or letters before our names or what have you. Often, uh, if you were to ask a person, uh, so what do you do? They'll say something like, I am a doctor. Or I am a, a lawyer, or I'm a farmer, or I'm a mechanic. Automotive engineer, sorry, Brother Mark. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I'm a shopkeeper, etc. In other words, often we tend to identify who we are with what we do. But I want you to see there is a world of difference between what we do and who we are. And in fact, as Christians, being a servant is not an occupation. It's not a description of a job. It is not reflecting our professional qualifications. In other words, we are not in God's employ as in a paid servant. It gets a lot lower than that. And this might surprise you, but this is not a, a label or a title uh, that we earn by studying at a school or that we achieve by our own abilities. We are called first and foremost by God to be his servants. We call, we're called away, every single one of us. Now, sadly, in our human mind, when we hear the servant of God, we think of some minister or pastor or evangelist, someone with a ministry of a kind. And yes, there is indeed a servitude that's implied in ministry. 
But I want you to see that when God called you to be his child, he also called you to be his servant. He called every single one of us to offer service yeah. unto him. In fact, you're doing that right now as you sit in this building. That's why you're here. Remember, this is a service. Who does service? The servants. Praise God. And it's so important that we understand this because all too often we don't see ourselves in the right light. Sometimes we see ourselves as more than we ought to. Other times we don't see ourselves as enough of what Jesus has called us and made us. So we are called first and foremost. And I want you to see that when he calls us to be his servants, this is not merely describing what we do, but who we are. I, I guess I want to get even closer than that. It's a statement about our lifestyle. Literally, it is describing how you are supposed to live your life, the life of a servant. It is describing uh, or intended to describe your identity. Literally, who you are within. Not merely a title that you wear from time to time or that you put on like a tag when you go to work, uh, cleaner or doctor or whatever. No, I'm talking an identity that goes with you everywhere. Okay, it is more than just something that we put on. It is a description of our personal character. Amen. Amen. It, it goes even beyond that. It prioritizes our relationships. Have a think with me for a moment. For instance, if I was to say to a doctor, say, okay, well, uh, who are you really? Apart from being a doctor, that's your job. He might say that he's uh, first a father or a husband. And if he cares for his family, he might say that. But for a Christian, I want you to see that being a servant of God prioritizes even our relationships. And I would go as far as saying, including being a mother, a father, a husband, a wife. It even goes beyond that because, you see, by having the attitude, the, the manner of a servant, we must first and foremost remain a servant of the living God. Yeah. So you might say, what, so uh, does God want us to be servants before we are parents to our children you know the answer is absolutely yes if we don't get that connection right if we don't get this right with god we are don't have a chance of being good parents to our children does god want me to be a servant to him and doing his work before i'm a husband and a wife absolutely because unless you get that relationship right you can't get any other human relationship correct it is a case of getting this vertical relationship right before we get all of our horizontal relationships right. And so you can see why it is so important that we have the right mind set. Being a servant of God should temper our attitude. It should adjust our manner. Sometimes we, we tend to be servants of God when we're at church, but then when we go to work, we're different people. In our business, we may behave differently. All of a sudden, we are different individuals. We speak differently. Our tone of voice is different. Our conduct is different. And I want you to understand that this being a servant of God defines your identity. And if you're not a servant of God at all times consistently, then the name Christian doesn't really belong to you and I. Is that fair enough? Yeah. Yeah. If that's hit you between the eyes, uh, what can I tell you? Please wear it because it's correct. According to scripture, we cannot put a Christian cap on when it suits us. Either we are God's people at all times or we're not God's people at all. And so to be a servant is to seek his will at all times. Let me define it for you. If I were to ask that question. Because you see, it affects our conduct everywhere, whether we are at home, at work, at school, anywhere in society. So what does it mean? What does it mean to be a servant of God? If you're taking notes, it's something of this nature. To be a servant of Christ, and this is just a summary, is to seek his will first in all things. Jesus said it this way, didn't he? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, our primary desire every day as servants of God is to honor, to glorify the one who brought our freedom for us. Saints of God, we were bound. We were servants and we were servants of all the wrong things. And Jesus saved us, and now our lives ought to be a shout, a glory, a song, a praise every day 
to glorify his name. And the question that I have for you and I is, are we true servants of the living God? Are we reflecting the task, the calling to which we've been called? So many attempt to become something more. I don't know whether uh, in music or in teaching or preaching in leadership in some aspect or another. And they've forgotten long before getting to that, we should all be first genuine servants. And so as a servant of God, we honor, we glorify him and we uh, do all to his glory. First Corinthians 10 31 says to do everything, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, you do how much? Everything, all to the glory of God. Now, you don't have to put your hand up, but have a look in your own heart. Just, just run your mind back in the past few days. Everything you say, everything you do, was it really all to the glory of God? And you straight away realize that all of us have a long way to grow yeah. to be the kind of servants that we ought to be. Can you see why we are genuinely unprofitable servants? Because there's still so much growth and so much space uh, in us to grow. Amen. There's still much that we have to uh, grow. Jesus himself said that we must deny ourselves or die to ourselves. In Luke 9, 23, he said these words, If anyone uh, will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And so again, we're saying, yes, I'm a servant of God. Yes, I love God. Yes, I serve God. I, I follow him. But do we deny ourselves? Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to deny yourself. There is a certain self-denial required in terms of serving God. This is a renouncing of ourselves. Why is this necessary? Because you can't serve two masters. You cannot serve God and your own desires. No more than you can serve God and the world or God and Satan. You can't do that. You can only be under one headship and serve one king. Hallelujah. And if Jesus is indeed the one that's delivered us from sin, our king of king and Lord of lords, then we ought to be his servants and his servants alone. Amen. Amen. But when we put those things aside and we ignore them or we don't take notice and we begin to serve ourselves, then brethren, we need to go back to the words of Jesus. If you will go after me, he said, deny yourself, take up your cross. There is a sacrifice implied here and follow me. We need to, as servants, renounce our rights to direct our own lives. And we don't like this because we all like to run our own lives. I mean, after all, we had parents to tell us what to do when we were little and now we're all grown up. <laughs> and now someone else is trying to tell us what to do. Well, guess what? You never really, really thought that you were going to be free from that, did you? <laughs> the truth is that when we say, yes, I love Jesus, I'm going to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, we are saying, I am going to be your servant, Lord. We are saying, I'm going to denounce the right to do my own thing and to make my own choices. And before I do anything, I'm going to filter it all through what you say to do, because you're the father. You're the boss. You're the one that calls the shots. And therefore, I am to be your servant. I want you to see that God delights in those that trust in him this way. And it is really the servant's desire to bring pleasure to his master. Okay. And it ought to be our desire to bring pleasure to God in the way that we do things, in how we function, in how we think. In fact, uh, in the scriptures, it says clearly, I think it's in Psalm 37, it says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he, God, delights in his ways. God delights when he sees a heart that's, that's desirous to do it right, to do things God's way, to be a true servant. Well, saints, our troubles start, and I'll tell you where they begin, is when we see ourselves in the wrong light. We don't see ourselves correctly. In fact, the scripture indicates that all too often we think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. You might say, well, actually, I, I, I think pretty low of myself. But even when you feel low of yourself, all too often, that's actually thinking more highly than you ought to. Let me explain that the word servant is translated from a Greek word pronounced doulos. And doulos actually is, uh, when translated, is a little more precise than, than just servant. It's almost like uh, we have utilized the word servants because it's a little easier on our modern ears, you see. 
That word actually more accurately means bond servant or slave. Uh oh. I thought it was bad enough. <laughs> a servant. Now you're saying I'm, I'm a slave? Well, that's what that word means. A bond servant, a purchased servant. Not a servant that comes in at 8 o'clock in the morning, does some cleaning and what have you, and then goes out and then at the end of the week gets paid. <laughs> no, a bond servant. Someone who lives in the household and is 100% totally, absolutely, lifetime long, dedicated to doing nothing more than serving the master. That's what that word means. Now, how do you feel? <laughs> servant of the living God. Doulos. The Apostle Paul said, I'm a bond servant. He was literally saying a slave to God. Now, understand that Jesus is such a loving master. He doesn't whip his slaves. Uh, the ne negative connotation that we have on slavery comes from sinful behavior. Men, individuals who did it all wrong. But this is not how God treats his people. Amen. And I want you to see that uh, this is why perhaps uh, this word is translated more like servant because our uh, kind of you know, sensitive modern uh, ears and sensitivities reject the concept because of the negative connotations. However, this is definitely a more precise understanding of the position we feel in God. And in ancient times, slaves were purchased or they were or they were born. I guess in a in a slave family and essentially they were there for doing nothing else but to serve the master until they died or until the master freed them in some way and this is exactly the title that paul and other apostles convey when they refer to themselves as the servants of christ why why is that well for the simple reason that just like that master would purchase that slave jesus purchased you and i think about it we were selling literally on the marketplace of dead humanity. In fact, we weren't very good purchasers either, some of us. And yet, you know, God paid top price. Jesus paid by his blood. He gave absolutely the best price for you to purchase you and to make you his. He bought you with his own blood. That's what Calvary is all about. That's what the sacrifice is all about. And so those that come to know this, they come to know him and understand his love for you. Then they choose to desire really to abandon all of their own choices and personal rights and to love him and serve him faithfully until the end. <laughs> but I can hear some of our minds and hearts right now. Wait, hang on a second. You call me a slave? How dare you? I'm a child of the king. Aren't we? Yes. Yeah. I'm a born again, family of God believer. I'm an heir of the kingdom. And I will say with you a resounding yes, absolutely you are. You are and we are, all of us are, when we come to Christ. But you see, this is the problem. We miss the identity of really who we are when we take a look at it. The world around us, and especially some of the, uh, well, current uh, Christianity, presents only one side of our identity. That is the, the one that looks at Jesus as our Savior, and it's quite beautiful. As our Savior, towards our Savior, we hold the privileged position as children of God, part of His family. Amen? And uh, But towards Jesus as our Lord, we hold, hold the privileged position of being servants. We like one, but we don't so much like the other. Yeah. Huh? That's true, isn't it? We like being family. We like the thought of Jesus as our Savior, our Deliverer, our Redeemer, and how He has helped us. But we don't like the thought that somehow we are yet indebted to the place where we owe all to Him. And yet when we begin to think about it, of course it's logical. He bought me. I belong to Him. He's, he owns me. The scripture says, don't you know that you're not your own? You were bought with a price. We forget. We forget we're servants. And not just servants, slaves. Bond slaves to God. Entire Christian organizations right now promote the aspect of family only. And by doing that, they're presenting an incomplete, if not false, gospel. 
What they tell you is uh, the benefits, uh, the wonder, the glory, the miracles, the wonderful things that come. Do they happen? Absolutely. God does all of that. But they forsake or they fail to tell you about the fact that you need to also fellowship in Christ's sufferings. Oh, that I may know him. Do you want to know him? Yeah, yeah, I want to know him. And the power of his resurrection. Do you want that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want that. I want that. But the Apostle Paul then says, and in the fellowship of his sufferings. Hang on a minute. I didn't know that was part of the deal. I didn't know that was part of the deal. But it is. As servants, there is a fellowship in the suffering. They don't tell you about the fact that there's a necessity for self-denial. They don't tell you the truth about living holy so that you glorify the holy God in your life. The holy God that saved you, that brought you from the miry clay of sin, all that was wrong and awful, into his marvelous life. And so, unfortunately, there is an incomplete gospel out there. And when we fail to see and to remember that Jesus is not just our Savior, but also our Creator and our Lord, we become lopsided in our relationship with God. Please see this. Please see it. If you see Jesus only as your Savior, you will love Him for what He does for you. But when you understand, when you accept that He is your Creator, He made you, He owns you, He has a stamp upon you, and more than that, He is your Lord and Master, now all of a sudden you realize that there is another aspect of this relationship that does involve your doing, your involvement, it involves your obedience. And when we cease to see it that way, and we become just familiar with God, we lose that true relationship that we ought to have all of a sudden there is no respect for god god is just daddy somewhere in the distance or maybe even the old man sadly and it's just a casual relationship god forbid we are talking about the almighty god who created us we're talking about the one that came in a body of flesh to save us but he is yet lord in our lives Amen. and unless we remember that unless we are reminded of that we will fail to be the kind of servants that we ought to be when we cease to be servants at heart saints we lose sight of our privilege and our position as children we don't understand any longer the correct relationship with us between us and the father we lose that depth, we lose that texture, that meaning, that, that beauty of what this is all about. And all of a sudden, there isn't the respect and love that there ought to be. I want you to see what happened with Thomas. Thomas uh, was not there, and it's not this Thomas, but Thomas the Apostle. And, his, and he, was, uh, he wasn't present when Jesus appeared the first time, remember, amongst the disciples. And they told him about it, they were so excited. Jesus came and he, he was so adamant about this he had seen jesus he had been with him during his lifetime but jesus had died and he said these words unless i put my finger in his wounds and in his side i'm not going to believe it now thomas was not a bad guy read it in the scripture he actually was a very faithful man when he was with jesus personally see familiar close he loved the Lord. In fact, at one stage, he suggested to all the others, let's go with the Lord. And if we die, we die. He was the one that encouraged the others to be faithful and strong. But in this case, he had allowed familiarity to break down the relationship between him and Jesus as Lord and God. Now, I want you to see his response when Jesus appears the second time. And Thomas is present this time. And Jesus said, Thomas, come here. Put your finger in my wound and, and put, put your hand in my side and see that it is me. Now, you don't see Thomas going, okay, all right, well, I'll, I'll put you to the test. That's not what happened. I'll tell you what happened. He fell on his knees and with, a, with tears, he exclaimed, not all oh, Jesus, my Savior. He said, my Lord and my God. He recognized that his relationship was not just with the Savior. It was with the Creator. It was with the Lord and Master. And he recognized the reason Savior as being Lord and God. And I guess that's really the essence of our servitude to God. Is that we need to remember 
that we are saved and in God's family by His grace, enjoying the blessings of God, benefiting from His beauty and His wonder and His spirit. But it isn't just so we can just go to sleep or, or relax in that wonder. It is so that we can serve Him. And when we lose that dimension, we lose the purpose of our Christianity. Is it any wonder that Christians become dissatisfied? Is it any wonder they're not fulfilled? In fact, some of them are downright bored. Because you know what? The previous years, or last week's program, it's now passed and now there isn't something exciting on. And so it just becomes a nothing because what we have stopped doing is serving God. We have stopped the purpose for which we were saved to serve Him. Think about it. Think about it. Why wouldn't Jesus save us and just take us straight to heaven? After all, what a better time, right? We're just brand new, out of the world, cleansed the sin, pure, filled with the Spirit. We walk on cloud nine for a while. How about just going to cloud 10, 11, 12 and go into heaven? That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? But Jesus leaves us here and he leaves us here for a very good reason. He says, now you're my child, but you're also my servant. Now, look, you might say to me for a minute, uh, well, you know, this um, th this bond servant business, is it's, it's a bit heavy. It's a bit out there. I mean, to call me a slave and to think of ourselves as a slave, uh, it's a bit out there. But I I'm going to have to remind you this way. In fact, let, let me do this. Let's remind ourselves for a minute, okay? Before I was the Lord's slave... I was Satan's slave. You see, there is only one of two ways. You see, you have to remind yourself that before we came to this great salvation, we were in bondage to sin. We were slaves to the devil. We were prisoners to the world and all of its chains. And brethren, let's not forget where Jesus brought us from. And just in case you grew up in the church and you say, well, I don't relate to that. I was never in the world. Then let me tell you uh, that you're blessed, praise the Lord. But nevertheless, it's that knowledge that you should rejoice in. And being a servant of God is even more important for people that have grown up in Christ. Lest we lose that position altogether and go into the world. Okay, think about this. The truth is this simple. If we don't serve God, we will serve someone. And the Bible tells you very clearly there are only two masters. Okay? It's simple, right? You either serve God and are His willful, willing, loving slave because of how He saved you, or you will end up serving yourself, the flesh, the world, and Satan himself. Amen. There is only two courses of action. There's nothing in between. People that think this way, oh, I don't serve God, but I don't really serve the devil either. I just do my own thing. You're deceived. Because if you're not serving God, you're automatically serving your position, the enemy. And like at a lamp, regardless of good intentions, there is a pathway made to hell, unfortunately, for all those that go down that way. I think we have to, with Joshua, say that for me and my house, we've made a decision. We have taken the stand. We are, we are not tottering between two opinions. We're not halting. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. 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 It's got to be made that way. Yeah. It's got to be clear in our hearts, in our minds. It's got to be settled once and for all. And so I believe that being a servant not only best describes, best fits the Christian makeup, and it's exactly who we are supposed to be. But also it's the safest thing for us to be. If you're not a servant, you're in danger. That might surprise you. But actually you are. Because the minute you're not serving God, think about it. Who are you serving? And that's a question we have to ask ourselves. If I'm not serving God, who am I serving? Who am I laboring for? What are my actions all about? Where are my thoughts for? Who, who, who am I giving myself over to? And so the protection that comes and it's a safe place when we are in god's service not only are we his children but we are his servants and god protects us and we are protected from falling back into bondage or into the enemy's hands we should see and we should consider serving god our greatest privilege saints of god not not some kind of hardship you know some people think that serving god is such a a labor you know, it's a hardship and it's such a sacrifice and a bother. 
But I'm going to tell you, it should be a genuine pleasure. Yeah. It should be an, an outright delight. Yeah. Amen. I delight to do thy will, O Lord. That's what the, the psalmist said. And that's the kind of heart, servant's heart, that God wants to see. And when we are that way, when we behave that way, then God calls us to further service. If you're faithful in little, he makes you faithful over much and much more. And so the service should be motivated by love and not merely, uh, uh, you know, a fear. Now, some people serve God this way. Ooh, I better do the right thing because otherwise he's going to send me to hell. Come on. Is that a right motivation for serving God? Think about it. What brought you to service in God in the first place? Wasn't, the, wasn't it the great love of God? The amazing grace of Jesus? Yeah. Wasn't it his example of how to love and so because of that, it ought to be that our best motivation for serving him is to do it because we love him. Amen. Saints, some of the greatest servants that we read about in the Bible, God's servants that we read about in the Old and the New Testament were also humble people. And this is another reason why being a servant is a safe place to be. Not only the right fit for the Christian, but it's a safe place to be. Because humility and servitude go hand in hand. In fact, they're synonymous. You can't have one without the other. You can't be a servant without being humble. And when you look at the best, the greatest, the most wonderful servants of God, they, like you and I, had a battle with the flesh. By being servants of God, they were able through God to overcome their flesh and remain humble in the sight of God. And so you see, there is a safety net, a safety measure in being a servant because humility is essential for being a servant. Those that are God's greatest servants oft too often reflect humility of heart. You can see them. They spend much. They're frequent in time with prayer with God and they're dependent on God. They trust God and they have quit relying on the arm of flesh. They've, they've done with, with using their own will. They simply follow after God. And as a result of that, praise God, they shine Jesus to the world around them. They're an example of being good servants. Let me close by sharing with you the last point that I want to make. And that is that being a servant is the Christian's greatest accomplishment. I thought when I had my first baby in my arms, this was one amazing accomplishment. Not that I did very much when you think about it. But, <laughs> but the truth is, it was just an amazing thing. When, when, um, uh, when God helped us to build a house, and I finally put the, first, the last block, I even wrote on it, the last block, you know, boom, put it up there. We look back and we thought, wow, that was a great accomplishment. But you know, none of those things, none of those things, it doesn't matter if you did much greater things than many people have done, much, 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 much greater things than any of that is really the ultimate accomplishment for the Christian. We live in a society, saints, where we are driven, we are taught by culture to be ambitious and to drive and achieve and pursue great things and and such ambitions and are sometimes honorable. Uh, they have sometimes good motivation. Sometimes they're attractive even. But many times and often they're just camouflages. They're just dress ups for human selfishness and pride. And unfortunately, these endeavors for the Christian all too often occupy much of our time. In fact, sometimes all of our time, all of our efforts, all of our mind, all of our resources, and they leave no room for God. And so here it is with our mouth, we say, yeah, yeah, I love the Lord, I serve God. But in our practice, we serve the achievement, the ambition, the thing that we are, that we are chasing. Sometimes in building a business, sometimes in working simply, sometimes in trying to build a family. I had one brother say, oh, no, no, I can't possibly preach once every three months because, you know, I'm busy feeding my family. And I'm thinking, oh, well, OK, so you are too busy to serve God so that even once every three months is just too much for you to do something for God. And what point is that serving Jesus? Quite justified. Hey, I'm doing something good. I'm, I'm helping my family. Can you see what happens? I'm accomplishing. And we have forgotten that we are servants of the living God first. And so I ask you to remind yourself what Jesus said. When you have occupied all yourself in those endeavors, you've spent all your mind, your time, your effort, your energy, and you're just so caught up with that. And you've left 
your service for God undone. Your relationship with God falls apart. You don't feel God anymore. The joy of, of salvation is gone. The hope of your salvation eternal is a distant thing. And now you're starting to wonder whether you live and make it in. At that point, the words of Jesus come loud and clear. Mark 8, 36. He said this. He said, for what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world? We strive for such little, by the way. But he says, if you gain the whole world, imagine that. The whole world and he lose his own soul. And they are, they're, they're incredibly challenging words, saints, because we we lose our own soul if we're not careful over a lot less than that. Yeah. And I would ask you to remember that first and foremost, a true believer needs to be a servant of the living God. Now, people have said when I've spoken this way, are you saying, therefore, that a believer can't study, can't get a degree, can't have accomplishments? Not at all. We're not saying that at all. In fact, I believe that um, believers in the scriptures often they have some of the greatest accomplishments and and that they can get places. And but the, the, the key is this. Let's accomplish as long as first, main and foremost, the most important ambition in life for the believer remains to be a servant of the living God. Can I put it to you this way? Isn't that what Jesus said? Yeah. Seek ye first. He didn't say don't have all the other stuff, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Everything else you want to pursue shall be added unto you, will be brought to you, will we'll take place. Anything that interferes, takes away, detracts, damages, or in any way removes that primary purpose that we are called to be, that servants of the living God should be pushed aside or at least minimized. It should be certainly not allowed, if not abandoned altogether, then abandon it if necessary, rather than to allow it to take us our relationship away from God. Amen. We've got to be tough saints because think about it. Who are we serving? What is this all about? When the time is done and we stand before God, are we going to be found righteous servants? Is he going to take out the ledger and say, well, okay, you know, I thought you were my servant. That's what you said. But actually, let's have a look at what you did with your time and with your efforts and with your mind and with your heart and with your finances and with your desires and your ambitions. Let's have a look. And the books will be opened. And then what? God help us to be good servants of the living God, faithful servants. Amen? Amen. And so Jesus addressed his uh, disciples. If you remember at one stage, they were arguing between who would be the greatest amongst them, you know, and who would rule over the others. And I'm going to see closer to Jesus than you. you know? And they were kind of having a bit of a banter. And, and maybe maybe they were quite serious. They wanted to sort of change positions. And, and he said, look, t take my example. He said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And what you're trying to do is to imitate the ways of the world. The heathen lord it over each other and they cross each other down to try and get on top. And isn't that just like our, our world today? Yeah. Corporate world especially, but our world generally. Hmm? Yeah. But he said, it shall not be so with you. The greatest among you. Listen now. The great, you want to be the greatest? You be the servant. You want to be the top notch? You want to be top dog, top cat, whatever you want to be? Be the servant. That's Jesus' way. And I want you to notice how diametrically opposite it is to the world. The world says, you want to get ahead? Cheat, lie, steal, uh, squash everybody else down. Step on their necks. Step on everybody to get to the top. Jesus says, no, no. You want to be the best? You want to be the greatest? Serve. Serve God and in serving God, serve others. Notice. Please, we don't serve other people. We serve God. But because of that, other people benefit. Amen. That's how it should be. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. We're not the servant of people. We're servants of God. Beautifully, though, Jesus showed us the example. He didn't just say what to do. He showed us what to do. Now, I think it was Aristotle, clever old man, that wrote a lot of things. And he said something like this. He said, I count him braver, more brave, who overcomes his desires than him who conquers his enemies. For the hardest victory is over self. Yeah. How true, right? Yeah. 
How so true? You see, we need Jesus, saints, in order to cover ourselves and our flesh. And as servants of God, um, we are best positioned for such victory and overcoming. God has given us His Spirit. He has shown us how to overcome. Listen, He became a servant. He put that, that towel on to wash the feet. He showed us what to do. And we read it, didn't we? At the very beginning of our message here to, we, together, He said, listen, I came down to save. Listen to his words here or to the words that are spoken about. Let this mind, notice please it's a mindset, a, a way of life, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Adopt the mind of Christ. Put it on. Take his mind. What was his mind? Who being in the form of God did not think a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, zero reputation. He didn't care what people thought. But he took himself upon himself the form of a servant. He made himself in the likeness of men. He literally took on a body of flesh as a servant. He humbled himself and then died and died the very death of the cross. That's the example of Jesus. Now, I said to you that I believe our greatest ambition ought to be a servant. Why do I say that? Because our greatest ambition is to be like Jesus. And if Jesus is a servant, then that's what I want to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. If he showed me how to live life as a servant, servant leader, but a servant nevertheless, then that's what I long to be. That's what I need to desire to be. That's what I must make my goal to be. I must do my very utmost to make that what I aspire to. Such is the victory that we could never achieve without God. But listen, if you do it humbly, if you lend yourself to God, remember the words is very clear. God resists the proud, but he does what? Gives grace to the humble. He lifts you up. As you try to serve him, he will do it. And such victory that we couldn't do on our own, we will do with him. I'm going to close with these seven things that I want you to remember, if you can, very quickly, of how as servants... God helps us to do these things. Have a think about it, if you can, at home, in your own time, perhaps. God helps us, if we're servants, to continue in faith until the end. The Bible says Jesus is able to keep us until that day. Aren't you glad? If you're a servant of God, yeah, you may be a slave, but you're a slave for a wonderful master. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen to this. There were some slaves that loved their master so much that at the end of the term, when they finally served their time, and the master could have released them, they said, Master, we do not want to go. We want to stay with you. Yeah. We love you. We're family. Can we please continue to serve you? That's the attitude of the Christian. Yeah. Yeah. And in those days, they used to take an oil and put a mark in it or a hole in their ear and put a special ring that said, now this is a free slave willfully serving as a bond slave. That is the attitude God is looking for from us. And so, you see, if we give ourselves to him, God will keep us. God doesn't beat like the slaves that we have imagined, but God, in fact, blesses us. In Jude one twenty four, the result of that is eternal life. Also, because we are servants of God, he gives us strength to destroy arguments against God and to bring thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, you may not realize how important that really is, but it is so vital, saints. When you live a life down here on earth, you are literally attacked every day by thoughts and things that are against God. And if you're a servant of God and you live the way he wants you to in obedience, he gives you the power to be able to fight these things off and to overcome them and bring them captive to Christ. Second Corinthians 10 and 5. Jot it down. Read it. It's beautiful. He also gives us the strength to practice and live and pursue a holy life. Now, you might say, that's wonderful, but why, why is that so important? Because when I was not saved, there was no such, a, a, there's no even an opportunity to know where holiness was at all. There was not even a chance that I could ever even go near the holy. But when I came to Christ, when he saved me, when he made me his servant, now I can live a life that is holy, yes. dedicated to him. Praise the Lord. And so it's beautiful that it says in, in the scripture that we must be holy even as he is holy. And also it also states that without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Now, we've had many studies on holiness, but I want you to see this is the result of being willful servants to God. 
God also gives you the strength to overcome the flesh. In fact, in Romans 6, you will read of how we have the power through God to crucify the flesh daily. Put this flesh down because it's your enemy. It's our enemy. Uh, we live in a world that says, you know, it's all self, self this, self that. And we're studying right now on Wednesday nights about selfism and how dangerous it is. But we have to, as servants of the living God, put that flesh down. He also gives us power uh, to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And please notice, with an unfeigned love. You know what that means? Not fake, a real love. So when you say, I love you, brother, you really mean it. You don't say, oh, God bless you, I love you. And then you have a go at each other. You don't tear each other down. The love of God is unfeigned. And God, through His Spirit, because you're His servant, gives you that power, that ability to be such a, a brother, a sister. And uh, most beautiful, He gives us the ability to store up treasure in heaven. You're not going to take it with you, brother. Sister, it's going to stay here. doesn't matter how much you've got. When you go... It stays. Simple as it gets. But I'll tell you what, though, as a servant of the living God, we may be poor here on earth, but we can be incredibly stinking rich, wealthy up in heaven. Hallelujah. Because you can send as much treasure up there as you want to, and God will not only stash it for you, it will be there forever and ever and ever and ever. Jesus says, store up treasure in heaven where neither moth eats and not rust corrupts and where thieves cannot break in and steal. Listen, we've got a back to front. All the efforts that we make down here are in vain, are temporal at best we'll leave it all behind amen and so we are able because we are servants to store up in heaven and what's most beautiful is that jesus has already promised us a mansion in heaven Hallelujah. Yeah. you may live in a weatherboard place here but not in heaven streets of gold amazing mansions amen and, and unthinkable unsought of we cannot even begin to imagine the richness that will exist if you're a servant of the living God. And lastly, he will give you the patience, the strength to run the race if you keep loving his appearing. And listen, there is a beautiful terminology in the Bible. Those that love his appearing. You know, there are some that hate his appearing. They know he's coming. He's coming in judgment. But you know why the servants of God love his appearing? Because the same coming is coming to redeem and finally take us out of this world. Finally and forever, we will be with Him. I'm going to love His appearing. Amen. We're going to love His appearing because we are the servants of the living God. Let, let me close today by saying this. Be the servant you need to be. And ask yourself from time to time, am I a genuine servant of God? Who am I serving? Who have I been serving this past week, this past month, this past year? Amen. Let me be a servant of God. There's a beautiful chorus we're singing. I really like like for us to close our eyes for a moment, and, and maybe you can sing it with me if you will. But I, I don't think it's it's appropriate for us to hear the word and just let it roll off and we forget it. Can we just take a few moments to have a look inside? Is that okay? Just have a look inside for a minute. Don't think about anybody else right now. Think about you right here. There's a chorus we sing, Make me like you, Lord. Make me like you. You are a servant, make me one too. And the key, the key here is, what kind of servant have I been towards the Lord? Have I really, really been, not just a child of God, but a servant of the living God? Have I served Him the way He deserves to be served? Let me sing it with you, and I pray that we can, in the next few minutes, just give over to the Lord. And, we, and if you haven't been quite the servant, or done the things that God wants you to do, then I would... Uh, encourage you right now just to restore and renew your dedication your consecration to him in the old testament moses consecrated aaron and his sons the priesthood by pouring fresh anointing oil over their heads and the bible records that the oil flowed down their heads and, and literally bathe them as it were. God has given you an anointing oil through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, saints. And I wonder if just today you will allow God to refill you and give you some fresh anointing oil, hallelujah, and restore 
renew, reconsecrate, <coughs> rededicate your life to Him as the servant of the living God. Hallelujah. I pray you receive God's word.